Thank you all for joining us for our sixth Howard Mathematica guest lecture by Professor Kyla McMullen. I'll begin by introducing our speaker. We will close with a few resources that will help you get to know Six Howard Mathematica if you are joining us for the first time. Dr. Kyla McMullen earned her Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she was also a Meyerhoff Scholar. She earned her Master's and PhD degrees in Computer Science and Engineering from the University of Michigan. While earning her PhD, she was also a faculty member at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. At Wayne State University, she taught computer literacy courses to over 2,000 students. Dr. McMullen is the first and currently the only woman of color to earn a PhD in computer science and engineering from the University of Michigan. She is currently a tenure track faculty member in the University of Florida's Computer and Information Sciences and Engineering Department. Dr. McMullen has a personal commitment to encouraging women and minorities to pursue careers in computer science and other STEM fields. She is, author, she is also the author of Beautiful Black and Brainy and Brilliant is the New Black, which showcases hundreds of exceptional young African-Americans who excel in STEM fields and don't fit the typical scientist stereotype. Welcome, Professor McMullen. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nana. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, everyone here at SIX, for your attention. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about using data to customize the 3D audio experience. I know you're probably thinking, what do all of those words mean together? Don't worry, we are going to get there. So first, I wanted to introduce myself. I've already had a wonderful introduction, so I won't belabor this point, but I am an assistant professor in computer science um, at the University of Florida. And my work deals with 3D or audio signal processing, but I also do work with brain computer interface, anything that deals with signal processing in a really cool way using signal data to be able to make any new inferences to enhance things and we apply that to augmented reality and virtual reality. So before we even get started, I have to talk about the people who make me look great. This, these are some members of my lab, and they are the ones who I am mentoring through the PhD, and they do amazing work, and I wouldn't be able to talk about anything without them. Shameless plug, I'm also a co-host of Modern Figures Podcast, which is elevating the voices of Black women in computing. The information is there. We tell the stories of Black women and how they reach their goals and how they get into tech. So the next part I'd like to introduce is what is sound? Because before we can talk about sound data and audio data, you have to understand a few things about it. So when we think of sound, we typically think of what is it that we're currently hearing, but it's actually a pressure wave that happens in the environment. So when matter vibrates quickly, that's when we hear sound. So we tend to describe the characteristics of sound in terms of their waveform characteristics. And so you may be familiar with this from terms in trigonometry, digital signal processing, or physics. So for example, on the picture here, uh, the amplitude, which is the distance from the x-axis to the top, of this determines how loud the sound is. The wavelength determines the pitch of the sound, so like a high or a low. So there's all of these different pieces that we're already familiar with because we've studied waves in school, but they have also digital and physical um, perceptual properties when it comes to sound. So um, as I mentioned, a couple I that I pulled out of the um, the graph, the amplitude is our perception of volume. So how loud is it? The frequency, um, you know, how long does it take to complete one cycle? That is the pitch. So we talk about like a low pitch noise or a high pitch noise. That's what we're talking about there. Just how fast does it take one complete oscillation above and below the x-axis? The period is also uh, known as the wavelength, and then time is still time. <laughs> so uh, we're also, we're already familiar with a lot of these things. So how do we get it to actually look like data? So we have to map analog data to discrete. So when we hear a sound in the air, that is the analog. It is continuous. It's something that's constantly happening, but we have to make it discrete. So digital sound is the way that we use electroengineering to sample at regular intervals the sound that's happening. So we usually capture it using a transducer, AKA a microphone. And so 
usually in, um, for example, with CD quality audio, we're doing that sampling 44,100 times per second. So I know that even right now, as you're hearing me through some digital medium, it's likely being sampled around that rate. So uh, we have some really fancy digital signal processing that's happening in order to make the sound that you hear. We don't hear it because obviously our ears are tuned to, um, to just interpret it as sound. So if we want to play sound back over some sort of digital means, for example, a loudspeaker, we can just create these physical waveforms and play it back. So it's a lot of really cool magic happening here. But the take home point is that sound is a physical thing. It's also perceptual. And then we can make it discrete and make it some sort of data components when we take it from a microphone and store it into digital Form because we do we know a lot about signal processing so that's when we can actually be dangerous and do some cool stuff with it before we get into the cool stuff why do we even care about sound so um, just a quick uh, PSA for sound in the interface usually we think about you know the visual parts but sound is used a lot for action confirmation for example you hear a sound that indicates that you sent a message or that you know the trash has been delivered to the trash bin or an email comes in so we use sound to deliver information or to confirm actions in an unobtrusive way so that you can know what's happening without having to visually overpower your uh, you know whatever you're looking at it can indicate that an error has happened. Um, error reduction is another uh, use for sound or actually a, um, something that is a cause of sound. So one example of that is in typing um, on your phone, you can turn on sounds. And if you have feedback for when you have typed a specific letter, research has shown that you have fewer errors when you get those feedback sounds. So it also helps with error reduction. Um, information accessibility, when you don't have visual cues, it can bridge the gap between sight impaired users and graphical user interfaces. So this means that people who are visually impaired will be able to also use the computer. And then sound can also enhance immersion and presence in virtual reality and augmented reality. And what's meant by that is um, once you get into an auditory or a visual environment, you put on, you know, that headset, that Oculus, or you're looking through that HoloLens, yes, the visual environment is very convincing, but the thing that really makes you feel like you're in that world, arguably, is also having that three-dimensional sound that you would hear as you're in there. So this is why we have, a, this is why we care about sound. Um, what is 3D sound? Glad you asked. So if you um, think about 3D in general, when we think about virtual reality, it's typically delivered over a pair of glasses, as seen as this picture, and away from you, you get this sort of perception of, um, of distance, of shape, of texture, and this is because two different pictures are given to both of your eyes, so you, your eyes kind of put the puzzle together and decide what that 3D shape is. So with 3D sound, we try to figure out, okay, how do we do that with our ear. So as I mentioned before, in a virtual 3D environment, you have, you know, two different pictures that are given to your eyes and your brain actually combines them to infer what the digital scene is. And we actually do something sort of similar with 3D audio. We give two different sounds to both of your ears and then your brain combines it to say, okay, if I were to hear those two different sounds in my ear, the sound is likely over here. So there's some fancy math to figure all that out that we'll get into in a second. Um, but if you're interested in 3D audio, sometimes it's called virtual acoustics, binaural audio, spatialized sound. All of these typically refer to techniques where a sound is filtered in some sort of way to give the illusion that it's being emitted from a particular point in space. So um, I included a link here. Um, you can experience it best with headphones and you can go to tinyurl.com slash 3D audio circle where I've put a few different sounds that you can listen to and these sounds are um, a sound of a, um, a music sample that sweeps around your head. So there's a couple and they sound like, they should sound like they're outside of your head and then sweeping, I believe this one is counterclockwise um, around your head, just so you can get a feel for what, the, uh, what kind of effects we're talking about. But how does the magic happen? So this is the data that we actually use um, in these sorts of calculations. So 
the this is where the magic happens and the magic is called her related transfer functions so I'll explain what they are through this quick example. So if you can imagine here on the left that um, there's a person and they have microphones inside of their ears, not earbuds, microphones, and then sounds are played at different locations around them and the microphones are picking up what's going to the left, what's going to the right. So each speaker that's here has two different measurements. Um, there's a left ear measurement, a right ear measurement, and you're getting that at a bunch of different locations. So um, the left ear gets a sound, the right ear gets a sound. So even in this example, the sound is to the left of the user. So the left ear has a slightly higher amplitude than the right ear because it's closer and it should be louder. Um, also, there's a very small delay in time because the sound actually has to travel around the person's head to get to the right ear. So there's a small delay in time as well. So with this, um, we're able to create filters um, through which we can take any sound source digitally, create a filter, and then do a convolution process where we take basically any sound source and then we can con convolve it with this filter that we get. And then when it's played back over headphones, it sounds like it's coming from that same measured location. So we basically create a database of all of these different locations and what their corresponding filters are. So if a sound needs to be played at 30 degrees to the left, then you say, okay, what's the left ear and what's the right ear for that? Convolve your sound with it and you can play it there. So. That's, the, uh, that, that's how the magic happens. This is an example of uh, one of the kinds of rooms that you would measure this in. I believe we were in Poland in this picture. I'm the one who's not looking at the camera. I do not know why, <laughs> but uh, this is a measurement chair that one of my colleagues, Mikhail, that he has in his lab. And the way that he does it is that this is an arc of speakers here. And he sits in this chair and as he rotates the chair actually the chair rotates and then there is a sweep of sounds so he can measure all of these different sounds the chair rotates measure all the sounds again so he gets this really complete and dense field of data that he can use to then um, deliver 3d audio we all got to do that when we were in his lab this is the uh this is what it looks like when he's not in there so as you can see there's this little thing and then the uh the whole apparatus, you know, moves. So it's basically an anechoic chamber. That's the other thing I forgot to mention. Like there's a false floor. Um, you have to get rid of all the reverberant um, material in the room. So all of the walls are made with special acoustic uh, foam. Um, you try to basically, I mean, obviously the machine itself has to be a reverberant surface, but everything else in there, you try to um, make as uh, quiet as possible. So as you saw with this sort of direct measurement procedure, you know, some of the risks with this is that um, one, you need an anechoic environment and that is not something that we all have in our back pocket. And sometimes these facilities can be upwards of a million dollars. Then you have to have probe microphones, which are those specialized microphones, <clears throat> excuse me, that need to be calibrated and put into the ears. Those are not uh, super cheap and also you have to put them pretty far into the person's ears so, so you have to trust whoever's doing that um, so as you can see there's specialized equipment it's costly it's time consuming so um, part of my research is okay we know how to make sound digital we know how to perform experiments what's a way that we can just use data to make this really good, really reliable 3D audio and not have to have a person in a million dollar facility. So um, some quick notes here that we went over previously um, with 3D audio cues, two of the main cues from the duplex theory are this interaural time difference that we talked about where the closer ear hears the sounds a fraction of a second before the farther ear and then the interaural intensity difference, or the IID, which is that the closer ear hears the sound a lot louder than the farther ear. So these are two cues to keep in mind. Um, so with the head-related transfer functions, um, they're measured as an impulse response, and it's usually pretty long. So usually they're about between 1024 and 2056 samples. So if you're doing digital signal processing and using a filter that's this long, it's going to take a while to actually render the audio, especially if it's in a real-time environment. 
So this um, what's typically happened is that the response is separated from the ITD because you don't the ITD remembers the time delay. So uh, we can just impose a digital delay instead of having to actually store it. And then um, the entire filter can be shortened to 128 to 256 filter coefficients. So it's a factor of 10 smaller. So on the right here, sorry, on the left, we have a depiction of the impulse response, which is if you imagine that there is a sound, right is always red, and there's a sound playing to the left of a person. So you can imagine that this um, the sound that's on the um, that's played on the person's left. The left ear amplitude is a lot higher and it starts before the right ear. The red um, amplitude is a lot lower and it starts a little bit afterwards. Um, so this is the HRIR, the head related impulse response. And usually either this is stored or the Fourier transform of it is stored, which is the HRTF. So if you look at this, the axes are different. Um, the X axis is actually frequency. The range of human hearing is about 20. Um, 20 hertz, which is around here, to 20,000 kilohertz. So as you can see, the left ear, which is the ear that's the closest to the sound, has a lot more energy. Sorry, and the, the left axis is the, uh, the sound or the intensity in dB and decibels. So here you see that the left ear is a lot higher, the right ear is a lot lower. So, and it's not completely the same at every single frequency, these spectral differences. But this is the data that we get and we can use it to do really cool stuff. Um, a really quick rendering depiction is that you take in, how this works, you take in a single channel audio source, and then you have this library of these time differences and you impose a digital delay. And after imposing the delay, you use the filter from the previous slide. Um, so first you do the left ears filter, you do the right ears filter, and then you play the sound that was filtered with the left ear, um, HRTF over the left ear microphone, I mean, left ear headphone, and play the right ear interpolated HRTF with the uh, right ear one. So doing all of this happens lots of times per second. You do not perceive it, um, and, but it's something that allows the environment to be perceived in a really real way. So if you're thinking about this, you're like, wow, okay, it sounds like realistic 3D audio is only measured on a single single person. So what about me? What about the average person? Everybody's head shape is different. Everyone's shoulders, ears, you know, there's so many different pieces of our body that impact how our brain interprets where sound is. So how in the world do we all get these sorts of uh, Get this sort of measurement for ourselves. So how can I experience good 3D audio without fancy, expensive, time-consuming, error-prone setup? So this is one of the things that I've been exploring. So one thing is called subjective selection. And the, the um, metaphor I like to use is picking a suit. So imagine that you, you get measured for a tailored suit. Someone comes in and they measure every inch of whatever it is they measure uh, to get a suit. The person makes the suit and they put it on a hanger in Macy's. And then they also put a bunch of other suits on the, sh on, you know, with in traditional sizes, you know, on the hanger. And your job is to go in there and pick out which suits, fit, which suits or suits fit you the best. You know, it would be cool to say, hmm, did this person actually pick the one that was made for them? Do they prefer one that's slightly different than the one that was created for them? So that's the idea behind some of the subjective selection work we've been doing. Um, a lot of the HRTF measurement facilities, including the one that I showed you there, they publish their data. So we have all of these pre-measured HRTFs that have been measured on hundreds of people. So the listener, they select which HRTFs they prefer by listening set to sounds that are rendered using those HRTFs. So the person can manually say, uh, I don't think this one works. Is this supposed to be 30 degrees? Sounds like 22, you know, or as much granularity as they can. Or, hey, this sounds like it's inside my head, but it should be outside of my head, et cetera. So one of the first questions that I sought to answer was, how does the actual HRTF that a person selects compare to the one that is measured on them? So this is a study, um, some of the results of a study that we completed 
where we had uh, about 27 HRTFs, 13 were from a database called CIPIC, 13 was from another in France called ERCOM, and one was a Kimar, uh, which is basically like a, a, a dummy head, um, a dummy head measurement. And we played a sound for 500 milliseconds or half a second, and we used their ITD, their own measured ITD. And through the procedure, they it was basically tournament style, where um, we measured first their actual HRTF, put that away, and then we rendered sounds with, other, with these other 27 HRTFs, and they went through three stages of testing. So the first test was externalization, which is the top here. So we asked them, out of all of these, which ones sound like they're outside of your head? So whichever one sounded like they were outside, only those proceeded to the next round. So then we played some sounds that were on the same angle, except with and without elevation. And we asked, okay, which one sounds, can you distinguish between up and down on these two? They said, yes, then, they, then those specific HRTFs then went to the final round where we played sounds in the front and behind them. And the last part was, okay, can you distinguish front from back with these? And they're on the same, uh, the same plane. Um, so it was pretty interesting. One of the things that we found out, I'll get to the data here. This was some of the data. So I know it looks crazy. I'm going to explain to you what this says. Um, the x-axis is the HRTF ID. So I mentioned that we had about 27, actually 28, with their own measured HRTF. So this one right here represents their own measured HRTF. 2 through 14 are the, I, the IRCAM HRTFs, and then 15 to 27 are the CIPIC HRTFs, and this 28 was that KEMAR, the dummy head one that I mentioned. So, the, and then the subject ID is on the y-axis. So subject one, this is what they picked. Subject two, this is the, what they picked and so on and so on. And the way to read this is that anything that has an X means that it only went through the externalization phase. If it has an asterisk, then it went through externalization and elevation. And then the filled circle means that it went through all three phases. So think of filled circle as being the winner. This is the one that they selected. So some cool stuff that you can immediately begin to see here is that um, with one being the one that was actually measured you know, for them, this is their tailored suit, only about 70% of people picked their the one that was measured for them. Uh, subject two and three, they it got through two of the the trials, but not all three of the tournament trials. But then what we also saw was that people also preferred HRTFs that were not their own measured HRTF. So that gave us a lot of hope because we don't. This shows us that um, listeners can choose HRTFs besides their own at similar rates as their own. Um, and what we also saw in this uh, upper right-hand corner here is that there was a strong preference for one of the databases over the other specific database. So um, we used that to continue the studies and only use CIPIC, and then we could delve into more HRTF studies and using data to manipulate it because of that. So the next thing we looked at is, okay, People pick these things. How reliable? Because people will people. And a lot of times with any sort of user studies, uh, people will are often uh, influenced by how they're doing that day, if they're tired, if they ate. There's so many different factors. So we wanted to make sure that we were measuring their actual um, preferences and that they weren't just a product of their day. So how reliable were these selections? So we, um, we conducted those same experiments, but this time over three different days. And then to see how did their selections change, we told them that they were <laughs> listening to different things each day, but they were the same thing each day. Um, and then the third question is, from the HRTFs that are selected, the ones that have those filled circles, what do they have in common? What's making people pick those? So we selected from the preferred HRTFs from the CIPIC database, in the MIT database, and as you know before, we did the exact same um, subjective selection procedure. And um, in the analysis to figure out the similarity between the chosen HRTFs, 
we had to have some sort of comparison metric. So we made one up. So there is a paper by Bill Martins about HRTFs and their decomposition. I won't bore you with this, but the outcome of the paper is basically that there are four different groups of subbands, and these are frequency bands that you can calculate that um, the HRTFs tend to differ in. So we looked at the energy within each of those bands and represented it as a four element vector that we then made a similarity metric in order to determine the distance between those two HRTF databases. So uh, the anything that has a small distance means that they are very close and very similar and a farther distance means that they are more different. So one thing that we saw in our results is that these colors are actually um, different HRTF uh, preferences for different subjects. And you can see that they start to separate. So it seems like people, one of the outcomes is that we saw people tended to prefer HRTFs that were kind of in the same wheelhouse. They were um, not very much different from each other in terms of spectral characteristics. So the theoretical distance between the preferred HRTFs was significantly smaller than the non-preferred HRTFs. So, that gives us some hope because we're like, all right, people are picking things that are kind of similar perceptually. But we started thinking too, asking people a lot of questions is really time consuming because, you know, it took about three hours across, you know, three different days, you know, an hour each. But what if we had a passive way to calculate this sort of thing? So what if we could use what we know about simulation um, to be able to just calculate the HRTF? A person never has to answer you. So one thing that we, um, so we started thinking about physical modeling and the reason is because it's accurate. Um, it doesn't require a million dollar anechoic chamber setup. And we already have a good idea of how sound already travels in the air. So we can use that to, um, to use that knowledge and basically program it using computational acoustics and physics to, uh, to render this. So the things that are required are a scan of the person's head and torso, a lot of precision, like millimeter precision of stillness. That was another thing. The person who's being measured has to be very, very still. And then a mathematical solver that simulates the sound at a bunch of different places and competes the sound in each year, thus calculating the HRTF. So uh, the solver part was the uh, obviously the, the hard part of this. So we decided it would be cool to do it. So we did it. So we prepared a mesh um, for computation. And this is actually a scan of one of my students from the beginning slides. So we have a collection basically of head and shoulder meshes. Um, and then at the ear, um, I won't belabor you with this, but the ear, since it is the closest to our ear canal and our brains, it has the biggest influence on how we perceive sound outside of you know, our actual heads, face and torso. So we have a really, really detailed mesh set of measurements of the ear that we do computations on. Then we have to clean and align the ear to the regular head mesh. And then we have to make them equilateral triangles for the formula to work. Um, and so we use this handheld 3D structure sensor to capture the 3D model here. So this is my student Tarek here. This is the picture, and then this is the mesh that's created. It takes a bunch of different um, pictures and it's post-processed using the It Sees 3D app. We covered everyone's hair with a slim cap so that we wouldn't have to deal with really creative hair in the calculation. We could just have a smooth, you know, smooth computation. But there's also some um, some challenges there too, because as you can see, like his hair is peeking out at the bottom here and it looks like he has like a lump in the back of his head. Um, so that's something, that's a point that I'll get to in a second. So the post-processing of the ear mesh, we use Zephyr, Zephyr to generate the mesh from a bunch of different pictures. So we take pictures at a bunch of different angles um, and then the generated object has to be easily discriminated from the background. So we have like a whole light set up and everything in the lab in order to do that. And this is an example of how the, um, the ear mesh is cleaned and aligned. So this is the normal mesh in the left, and then this more detailed uh, mesh on the right is what we actually clean and use to align everything. 
So of course, this comes with challenges. Nothing's easy in research and trying to get this data to do these sorts of calculations. So getting an accurate mesh was extremely difficult. We probably went through about four or five different techniques before we got what we needed. Um, getting a really detailed ear measurement was also very difficult to get it at the resolution that we need because sound waves, as you saw, are physical constructs, but um, they are also, they can also be very small. So being able to get the same size measurements on the ear that are around the same size as sound waves so that we can actually um, model how sound impacts the ears, that was, that was very challenging. Ear placement, since we take a picture of the ear separately, trying to reattach it programmatically uh, was difficult. We created these anchor points where we just aligned it back to the anchor point. The mesh got huge because we have millimeter accuracy. So we started exceeding the storage of the actual computer that we were using. So we had to move over to um, a supercomputer to be able to do this. And the computer we needed didn't exist. So we had to build a computer that could do this. Like it was, it was really serious. And then we had to think of which frequencies to simulate. It's really easy to, um, to simulate the lower frequencies. But as I mentioned, the range of human hearing goes from 20 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz. So we're doing each of these measurements for each frequency. But we were like, do we really need to do every frequency? Could we go up to 16,000? Would that be OK without going up to 20,000? So looking at how bad can this get? And we still have good, uh, good results. Um, as I mentioned, the hair before, finding a way to compensate for a person's hair, um, that's still a challenge. And the walls, torso, reflection, um, we had to put a few walls into the room so that there was something to actually have the sound reflect off of because as humans, we're never in an anechoic environment. So we were missing a lot of the cues that we usually are on. We usually, there's at least a floor <laughs> everywhere that we are. So uh, we had to add a floor to have sound reflect off of um, just so we could have that. And then the last, um, everything is assumed to be rigid. So in the actual computation, um, we know that things have variable impedance or you know softness. So the hair is your hair is not the same rigidity as your head. So being able to variably adjust that was another data challenge that we had. But we were able to create this HRTF simulation. Um, these are two sounds that are shown here. One of them is simulated. So the simulated one is the blue, and then the measured one is in red. So as you can see, um, the, measure, the measured is pretty, we're pretty close to, um, to the HRTF. And if you're curious about um, what this sounds like. You can listen to 3D sound that was created from our mesh as well as the measured one and see if you can hear a difference. So tinyurl.com slash HCC 3D sounds. So take a listen and yeah, let me know what you think. Um, we simulated from 100 hertz to 20,000 hertz. It took a long time to do it. And um, I want to add that this graph is only for one location. So it's elevation zero and angle or azimuth 60 degrees. So we have to do this for a bunch of different locations all around the person. So that's why some of the computation takes a while. So in doing all of this, we had to create the solver that I talked about. So this is the setup for the HRTF simulation. So there's a sound source that exists in space right here um, at X0, and there's an incident field that's associated with that sound source. So the incident field includes a, a scattered field at the boundary of the listener. So this boundary around them, and it's at feet. So the total field is equal to the incident field plus the scatter field. So the take home point is that if we can solve for this, then we can actually calculate the HRTF. So the goal of all of this was to solve for it. So I won't uh, belabor a bunch of equations, but um, the whole take home point is that it uses green function, which is a special function of the Helmholtz equation and the Helmholtz kernel based on green's boundary integral formulations. 
And the way that that works is that we use this compact form of this equation. So the solver works by converting the partial differential equation of the Helmholtz equation into its boundary integral formulation. And then after that happens, we solve the uniqueness problem. So L prime and M prime here are able to be written in a non-compact form. So this is a necessary but sufficient condition for the Helmholtz equation. So then after that, we arrive at the Burton and Miller method formulation to target the non-uniqueness problem. So our goal here is to solve for this phi in the boundary integral equation. So now that we have this solver that can essentially figure out what is the HRTF, what is the shape of this thing, and be able to create um, really cool um, filters that we can use to make 3D audio. Some lines of inquiry are in high performance computing. For example, um, right now it's implemented using one GPU. I'm sure it can get a lot faster with multiple GPUs with more parallelism. Um, we're also going to coordinate work between the CPU and GPU for higher efficiency. Sometimes you're just trying to get something out and you just want it to work. So we're looking at uh, efficiency now here for higher efficiency. Um, we also want to look into some machine learning applications here. So we want to create our own database of HRTFs that have been calculated based on a person's 3D head mesh scan. And we want to see, is there an inherent mapping from our own human geometry, our anthropometric um, measurements? Is there a mapping to our HRTFs through machine learning? So it's kind of solving this problem in a different way, where if we have a bunch of meshes and we have a bunch of measured HRTFs, which features actually create the HRTF? That's something that's not well understood. And then also in HCI, um, one of the future lines of inquiry is to investigate the quality of perception from computed HRTFs. Is this even worth doing? Do people even hear the difference from this? Uh, you know, how and how bad can this be before it actually works? So um, one use case for this is suppose that you go to insert big box electronics store here, you go there and you are buying a speaker system or you are buying a pair of headphones. You could have your head scanned as you are purchasing it. Some server on the back end can take your head scan, render 3D audio for you, so or render your HRTF so that sound could be given to you either at home on your couch through the speakers in a certain way, certain way that is actually customized to your ears and your body. Or when you listen over headphones, you know, you can actually hear sound if that's meant to be spatialized in those accurate locations. So um, and also in VR and in augmented reality, being able to get really, really accurate sounds. So um, this leads us to applications. So one thing that we found out, uh, we had a curiosity about um, augmented reality and how much does 3D audio actually help. So we did an experiment with about 51 people and they had to locate 36 spheres twice. So there are three different conditions. One, they had to locate it visually with only seeing it. The second is visual plus 3D audio. And the last was just 3D audio. And um, here, the you can't tell here, but the most significant, there was no difference between the visual plus audio as well as the audio, but both of them were significantly better than using vision alone. So. The take home point is that in augmented reality, people can locate visual objects with 3D audio faster than without it. Another um, thing that we saw, is, or that we're investigating rather, is the use of 3D audio for people who are doing rescue tasks. So if we know that simply looking is not efficient, then we can augment search and rescue tasks with 3D sound so that people can be found quicker. So we're integrating data from lots of different sources to help support decision-making here. We have some indoor localization tools that we're using to help with that. That one is a to be continued or right now um, doing a lot of psychoacoustic experiments to figure out um, you know, moving sound sources. How do people respond to moving? How, how degraded can the sound be, et cetera, et cetera? How are we rendering the sound in the best way? Can we make it any better? So, um, there's lots of ways that we're manipulating the data before we get into the actual 
um, use case of deploying this with firefighters. And another is a sort of entertainment, sort of fun learning experience. Uh, we created an augmented reality museum exhibit experience. So this is a collaboration between our museum studies and library collections, where imagine that you go to a library, to a museum rather, um, their museum is in the library. So I keep saying <laughs> library, but you go to a museum and you see different exhibits and as you, you have on a pair of headphones, wireless, and as you walk through the space, you can actually hear sounds at the location of the exhibit. And as you walk through, you kind of get different sounds in their locations um, to help with the experience. You may get um, an oral history, you may get some sound that complements the actual exhibit. So a lot of this, it's definitely a collaboration interdisciplinary where we work with museum studies um, specialists who know what, how to best create this sort of scene. So that's another fun thing that we do. So with that, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. If you found this interesting, I'm also open to collaboration. All of my contact information is listed here. I would love to hear about any cool applications of the research, or if you're just curious about what we're working on, feel free to contact me. Thank you for joining us, Professor McMullen. I know our participants are looking forward to live Q&A and office hours with you during the Institute in June. And I am particularly excited about your participation in our new series, New Frontiers in Research and Technology. This summer's panel will be the future of research and equity in the metaverse. Awesome, I can't wait. <laughs> Me too. Thank you all for watching. For more information on six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.